Hello, Adi. Thank you for joining us. This is Chris P with Rush Our Coach Development Webinar. Today, we are joined by Alex Twitchin, all the way from England. Alex, thanks for joining us. Please uh, share your story with us and give us your journey. My, my, my journey, uh, my story. So it's been a bit of a, a, me a meandering journey. I wouldn't say in any way that it was planned. It's just kind of like uh, happened. Uh, so I started coaching when I was fairly young. I was um, uh, my first year at university, uh, I played soccer. I wasn't a particularly great player, uh, but I enjoyed playing. And uh, the university that I was at just happened to be running a, an FA coaching course. It was the week before we went back um, for the spring term. And I just thought well, that that's kind of interesting. I'm not doing anything that week. So I signed up for it. Um, it was a cold, icy, snowy January. Um, but I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, just kind of made me reflect and think about the game in a way that I hadn't done so beforehand. And the tutor that we had was really, uh, you know, really knowledgeable, really skilled in the way that he kind of delivered the course. So it kind of just fired my enthusiasm for coaching. Um, and then I kind of didn't do much with the qualification until a friend of mine, uh, she played football and uh, she, she captained the women's team um, and she wanted to take things a little bit more seriously. So she asked me if I'd coach the women's team. So I did that for two years. Um, and then kind of at the same time, I was fortunate that I lived close to one of our national sports centers and they used to run a lot of FA fun weeks. And I got to know the guy who uh, organized those and he was always on the lookout for coaches. So I started working for him. So over a period of about three years, I had some really good experiences in terms of working on your typical kind of um, holidays, children's coaching camps, and then coaching the women's team at university. Uh, when I left university, I did a summer working out in the States at Long Island uh, with two people who you know, I have a lot of time for and a lot of respect for and still kind of keep in touch. That's Gary Book and, and Tim Bradbury. And I think they're both still involved in, in various things at this moment in time. Um, and after I came back from the States, I, I kind of started to, um, studying to be an accountant. But after about a year, that didn't really work out. So I became like a self-employed football coach and organized children's after school clubs. I organized holiday camps. Um, I kind of lived in a place called High Wickham and the local football team there uh, were on the rise. They were on the up. They had appointed Martin O'Neill, who um, yeah, ex Nottingham Forest. Um, he was the club's first full time manager. They had a little community scheme. Uh, Martin was kind of supposed to run that, but he kind of wanted to focus a little bit more on managing the team. So the club asked me to um, to take that on. Uh, which was, you know, again, another really good experience of running a, a community scheme on behalf of a club. And then I kind of started working part time at my local college, delivering courses for 16 to 19 year olds. Um, and just kind of went back to university, did a master's. And then I kind of got a job at Chichester, which is a small university down on the south coast. And uh, that was back in 1995. And since then, I've just done all kinds of things really related to football. I kind of coached the university team. We had quite a decent side, played in the National University Championship, did quite well in a couple of years, uh, started tutoring for the FA. So did a lot of FA level one, FA level two, UA for B license courses as an instructor. So I found that was a uh, really um, interesting experience in terms of not only developing my tutoring skills, but also developing my, myself as a coach. You know, when you've got to deliver something to other coaches, it kind of makes you think and reflect on your own coaching. And I kind of did a year as technical director for the Girls Centre of Excellence at Brighton, um, worked in the sort of boys academy at Bournemouth running a talent development centre, uh, managed a semi-professional team for two years. And then for the last three years, I've been working down at Portsmouth in their academy, running or coaching the under 13 team. So 2006, 2007s at the moment. Um, so that's, yeah, that's quite nice. They're a really nice bunch of lads. Uh, I really enjoy the coaching that I do with them. Um, so it's it's been a journey which has had no 
uh, how can I say, no plan. Uh, I've just kind of looked at opportunities as they've come along and got involved. And But when I look back, it kind of makes sense and it's kind of given me a bit of a, a broad, broad range of skills, I think, both across you know, my actual coaching and then the kind of coach learning and coach development space as well. Brilliant. What a, what a, uh, what a rich history there. Um, <laughs> you know, getting thrown in in your, was it your first year of college or your last year of college into the FA? Uh, the FA, no, the FA Prudy was my first year. Yeah, my yeah. first year. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And who was your instructor, Alex? Uh, he was a guy called Alf Colton, who at the okay. time was a regional coach for the uh, East Midlands. So the regional coaches had a uh, part of their remit was to deliver prelims. Um, and yeah, so it was the first week in January. Like I say, it was cold, it was icy, it was snowing. We had to go on the Astro turf. I managed to uh, sprain my ankle crossing a ball. So for the last two days of the course, I was hobbling around. Uh, but Alf was brilliant. And actually, after I left university and started working as a self-employed coach back home, um, I bumped into Alf again because he left the FA and he was now managing um, a semi-pro club close by. Uh, so I got to know Alf in a kind of different capacity. Uh, a few years later but uh, yeah it was it, like I say it was it really fired my enthusiasm for coaching because it just kind of at that point I hadn't really thought about what I was doing as a player you know I just kind of played but that was a kind of an insight into well actually there's a lot more to this game than you think and actually trying to coach people is a lot more challenging than you think yeah um so just obviously Alf was a, a big influence, right? You, you talk about a cold January in in uh, in England, and then doing a coaching course, and then hurting your your ankle. But just mm -hmm. just wondering, like the impression that Alf made on you to obviously continue and, and get about that, and then travel, you know, to come to the states with Gary yeah. and Tim Bradbury. Tim is still involved. Tim is mm -hmm. uh, a USSF instructor, and we talk regularly. He just sent me an article actually on. Um, different learning styles and things and sessions but uh, just you know look there's so many things to unpick and we didn't even touch what you're doing right now with the uh, Open mm. University yet True. so do you want to do you want to yeah, so, talk a little bit about that yeah so I spent the uh, best part of 22 years working at Chichester it's a typical small university face to face we have about 5,000 students um, I taught on a, a range of courses there, sport development, sports coaching. And then over the last sort of six years that I was there, we developed a football coaching and performance degree, um, which was, I was kind of always reluctant to set up a highly specialized football degree because I just felt that it was a bit too, too narrow and I wasn't quite sure what kind of student we would attract. But I was kind of finally persuaded by my colleagues to, um, to develop this program and uh, it's it's been really successful it's thriving um i occasionally pop back and see my colleagues and maybe do the odd guest lecture now um but we've had some some good students that have gone on to do other things in the game so we're working at you know some of our local professional clubs like brighton bournemouth southampton um some a little bit further afield um but I kind of got to the point, I guess, when you spend 22, 23 years at the same institution, you, you feel as though you need to kind of stretch yourself, challenge yourself, um, and maybe go and do something a little bit different. And I'd been a, an external examiner at the Open University, so I was kind of a, aware of the approach um, that they took. And obviously everything is online, it's, it's distance learning. And it kind of quite intrigued me. So a position came up and I applied and kind of got the job so I've been at the OU now for a couple of years and it's a vastly vastly different organization to the one that I was at previously uh, so whereas Chichester had 5,000 students at the Open University we have around about 150,000 students um, everything is delivered online so we don't have any kind of face-to-face -face, uh, teaching um, my role is to kind of write content write material and produce the modules so I don't have any direct contact with our students. Uh, I don't do any kind of 
um, tutoring in that respect. So for me, it's, um, and I still think I'm making the transition, if I'm honest, I'm still kind of finding my feet because it's such a vast organization. Um, but yeah, kind of a, a huge transition going from standing up in front of a group of students for 16, 17 hours a week to kind of mostly working from home and writing and producing content and occasionally filming things and just putting it all together into an online into an online course um yeah. so that's kind of what i do at the moment along with my role down at portsmouth and i also still do a bit of tutoring for the fa and some mentoring for the fa as well so it all kind of dovetails together quite nicely yeah and i can uh, i can guess in current times alex that uh, that yeah. the the distance learning and online stuff is going to become even bigger and even more with, yeah. the, with the current situation obviously that you know mm -hmm. um so you did you were part of uh developing a course and it was coaching others coaching others to coach course yeah that's right course, right yeah. um do you want to talk a little bit about that and yeah um how that came about okay so um i kind of know a, a chap called stuart armstrong so stuart is head of coaching at sport england i think mm, perhaps some of you might be familiar with stuart because he runs a quite popular podcast called the talent equation you know, ditch those drills uh, <laughs> so stuart and myself have known each other for a for a few years and we kind of reached out to stuart and um you know for a conversation around is there anything we can do to support the new coaching plan which uh, they launched because there were elements in there around developing distance learning possibly remote mentoring and, and things like that um one of my I don't necessarily call it a passion one, one of my one of my insights let's say was that um you know there's there's not a lot of support for the people that support other coaches you know whether you be a tutor whether you're a mentor an instructor a coach developer or a coach educator what, what however whatever kind of terminology we use there's, there's not or i didn't feel there's, there's that much support that those kind of people could get and so we kind of put a proposal to stuart to develop a course which wasn't aimed at coaches as such but was aimed at developing the people who develop coaches coaching others to coach uh, and how could they develop their skills how could they support coaches better and, and so forth and it was kind of uncharted territory in my view um stuart bless him took a punt he gave us a grant and we developed that program on what is known as the open universities open learn platform so it's free learning it's part of our royal charter um you know the, as an open university we have to provide a certain amount of our curriculum freely accessible to anyone um, so we kind of put it on the, the open learn platform as opposed to putting it on a more commercial paywalled kind of site because we wanted to, we wanted to get, as, uh, get as many people as possible to access the course. Um, and that's kind of like my first big project that I, that I developed for the OU really. And uh, I, I really enjoyed it because it made me think a lot about my role as a tutor, a lot about my role as a mentor. And it's a very interesting area at the moment because I think it's one that's attracting a little bit more interest from a research point of view. Um, and I think it's also an area that's attracting a little bit more interest from a, a more practical, pragmatic point of view. Um, here in the UK, for example, we're having a bit of a debate about the terminology, particularly between, say, coach developer, coach, educator, tutor, mentor, instructor. You know, what do we mean by all those different terms? Um, I know the, the ICCE, the International Council for Coaching Excellence, have a definition of coach developer as a kind of all-encompassing umbrella term that embraces all those kinds of different roles. Um, there's a little bit of a school of thought, I think, in the UK that a coach developer has a little bit of a a narrower definition in, in terms of being someone that works with you know, perhaps more experienced coaches um, less of a teacher less of an educator in a sense less uh, less less about building a coach's knowledge base more about taking experienced coaches who have that knowledge base and perhaps challenging them to think about how they're applying that knowledge in a different way giving them a different perspective a different lens to kind of see their coaching through 
So um, yeah, it was a fascinating project. It's gone down really well. We've had just over 2,000 people register on the course since last July. We've had some really nice feedback. Um, I've used it in some blended learning approaches. So for example, I'm just in the middle of a project with England Boxing, where they've taken four of their national coaches and each one of those national coaches are gonna mentor four other performance coaches. So we got each of the national coaches to just take two of the sessions in the course, uh, two sessions each. So between them, they covered all eight sessions. And then we met in Sheffield about a month ago now, a bit longer. And each one of the national coaches presented, it was only supposed to be 20 minutes, but <laughs> they kind of went on for about 40 minutes each, but they presented back to the rest of us, the two sessions that they'd looked at. So it was a really good way of sharing the learning, sharing all eight sessions across the four of them. And then, um, you yeah, know, it's, it's giving them a little bit of support. And we're also looking at another project, excuse me, with a, with a sports charity called Street Games who really work with uh, disadvantaged young people, um, use sport as a way of kind of trying to encourage them back into education and training. And they have a group of national tutors and the national tutors are hopefully um, study, uh, studying the, um, the coaching of us to coach course. And I kind of talked to them and interviewed them before before they enrolled on the course. And the idea is then to interview them after the course to see whether the course has had any impact or influence on their tutoring, on their delivery. Um, so for me, that's gonna be quite an interesting kind of insight research project to see whether the course does have an impact on what a typical coach developer, coach educator, tutor does. Um, because we kind of put these courses on our platform and they're there and people access them. Uh, there is a forum function, but we never really know what impact or influence they've actually had. So to try and you know get a little bit of um, evidence would be good. Yeah, so it's sure. freely available. You can go to the Open Learn uh, platform, Coaching Others to Coach. You, you, don't, you don't need to pay anything. You just need to create um, an open university account so that you can access all the content and all the features. Um, I really like our open learn platform because it's not like a MOOC where you have to study the course in a certain time period and you have to study it sequentially in a linear kind of way. So you can just go, you can just access it whenever you want. There's no time limit. Um, you can go straight to session eight if that's the kind of session that you're interested in. You can just kind of navigate your way through it however you like. There are some quizzes in there. And if you actually complete the whole course and you do a couple of the quizzes, you can get a digital badge. Um, and we know from some research in other areas that people actually like acquiring these digital badges. They kind of add them to their CVs as it were. You know, it's not certificated, it's not an open university qualification as such it's it's kind of an attainment badge really uh state yeah you know, um but they seem to be quite popular in terms of the way people um collect these kind of digital badges yeah brilliant maybe worth checking out yeah absolutely it is worth checking out i've actually uh done the course and mm -hmm. uh there's a there's another person on juan gonzalez mendia from south Ooh. america coaching um hello one i have yeah, he, he says, I've done the course. When I saw how many hours it would take, I thought about, ah, oh, really? By the time he was done, he said he couldn't believe how fast the time went. And he goes back um, as a regular coach developer and uses that stuff. So um, you've got my testimony and you've got Juan's testimony on the course. And the feedback was, uh, I loved it. Um, what uh, I did it before I did my American B license. And the thing that stood out to me was the, the imbalance of power with instructors yeah, yeah. right <laughs> and uh you know i did my c license many years ago came away from the federation um, because of a terrible experience uh with a with an with an instructor and then going back there was still that imbalance of power but it wasn't flexed upon um mm. all the time um so this is this is a question from one as well he says uh what's the best bit the most challenging and how do you do learning and development what in terms of at the OU? 
Or... For you, I think. I think he's talking for you. What is the, the best bit for you? What is the most challenging? And how do you do your learning and development? Okay. Um, directly to you, not for the open universe. So. Okay. So for me, uh, uh, let, me, let me take the last one first. How do I do my learning and development? So, I mean, I did my FA full badge back in 1994, and then I converted that to the UA for A license back in 1998. So the best part of 22 years ago, that was the last time. If this, I suppose I've done the youth module since then, but let's say I've kind of exhausted the FA's formal coach education structure many, many years ago. So for me at the moment, the way I learn and develop is probably twofold. Um, I like listening to podcasts. I like kind of doing quite a bit of reading. Uh, but what I also find is I have a really good group of friends and colleagues around me that I learn a lot from. Now, when I was at Chichester, I, looking back now, I think we had such a good community of practice, if that's what you want to call it. Um, and we always shared ideas. We were really supportive. Uh, we all had slightly different experiences in soccer, which was great because then we had you know, kind of different experiences to draw on. So Dabba was coaching at a quite high level semi-pro club. Perry was coaching a Portsmouth women's team in the FA's National League. Uh, Danny was kind of finding his feet in terms of tutoring with the FA and, and what have you. And we had uh, Duncan, who was a, previously a professional player, just making the transition from playing into coaching. Uh, so we all had slightly different experiences but we all just gelled together really well so a lot of my learning and development came from that little community what i i'm not sure if i appreciate it at the time but having gone down to portsmouth now different group of people uh different experiences and we've got one person down there particularly uh who's our head of coaching and learning which is sean o'driscoll and, and sean's got a really good reputation in the game as a kind of innovative thinker, you know, he's, he's managed various professional clubs, Bournemouth, Doncaster, um, he coached the England under 19 and he was also the assistant at Liverpool with Brend, uh, Brendan Rodgers for uh, just under a year. And Sean, Sean's got a lovely manner about him in which he's quite honest, he's quite direct and, and you can say something and he'll go like, well, why would you do that? You know, just, and you think, yeah, why would I do that? So I've kind of found someone who uh, challenges me, pushes back, and I think you really need that. Uh, my little group at Chichester some possibly almost become became like an echo chamber. Um, and so I guess the point I'm making in terms of learning and development is that I think you need to find trusted colleagues you can share things with but you also need to find people that you trust and respect who will give you a different perspective and push back a little bit and challenge you. Uh, so, you know, for the last year working with Sean at Portsmouth has really made me think about my coaching and he's got a very different approach. Um, one will be more than familiar with this person. So uh, we have Mark Bennett working with us on a kind of, yeah, um, a limited, limited uh, approach, I would say. Uh, but, you know, we're kind of trying to incorporate a lot of Mark's ideas into our coaching program at Portsmouth, taking a kind of behavioural approach. And so I'm kind of dripping all that kind of stuff into my coaching and playing with it and experimenting with it. I did a, one of Mark's masterclasses when I saw Alan Keane at Reading Coach. And so yeah, I'm just kind of trying to develop myself, push myself and, and learn and continue to develop. Um, most challenging aspect, I think it's... For me, it's you know, it's aligning the different aspects of knowledge that you need to have as a coach. So you try and immerse yourself in the technical and the tactical aspects, but equally it's about you know understanding how you build the relationships with your players, how, how you're self-aware, how you understand yourself, your values, um, and all that kind of thing. And so kind of aligning and linking and connecting those different parts of, of, of the knowledge that you need to have to be an effective coach is, is, is quite challenging. Um, you know, I go, I'm, a, I'm a Spurs supporter, I'm not a season ticket holder, but 
I kind of go and watch them about four or four, four or five times a year. And I take a little book with me and I sit in the stand and I kind of analyze the game. And that's my kind of technical and tactical uh, workshop, watching Spurs um, or not. As a, <laughs> maybe I watch the other team. <laughs> I went to the Leipzig game, what was that, not so long ago, and spent more time analysing Leipzig than I did analysing Spurs, because they were far more impressive than Tottenham. Um, but I call that my little kind of uh, tactical workshop, going to watch Tottenham. And you sit next to a Tottenham supporter and you've got your little book there and occasionally, eventually they say, what are you doing then? I say, well, I'm just like analysing the game. You strike up a conversation and say you have a bit of a social as well. And we have a right good mode about how poor Spurs have been. <laughs> um, yeah, so I probably yeah. want you know, gone off far too long there, but no, yeah. not at all, not at all. I think there's a lot of things to unpick, obviously, with the just surrounding yourself with friends and colleagues, someone who can give you good and honest feedback. Yeah. Just self-reflecting too, though. I think as uh, as coaches and coach developers, we go through and. You know, there's moments we've done a session and we're reflecting on our own session. And I think we can be quite harsh to ourselves. And I think the best advice there might be, you know, talk to yourself as if you would talk to another coach. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I, I just, yeah, carry on, Alex. Well, I was going to say in terms of the kind of mentoring and coach development work that I've done, um, I think helping uh, writing the coaching of us to coach course had a massive impact on the way that I approach my tutoring and mentoring. So the, on the FA's mentoring program, which I started five years ago, um, I would say that I've almost radically changed my approach now to how I work with mentors. Uh, it's what it's far more. It's it, okay. So the biggest change is yeah. I kind of think I started that mentoring program uh, thinking that they needed my knowledge, they needed my support, and I felt as though I felt I wasn't doing my job unless I wasn't delivering some kind of content to them. You know, whether that was taking a session or, you know, whatever. Now I would say I flipped that on its head and uh, I, you know, I spend more time getting to know them, more time understanding them. Uh, I offer them a range of things that they can get from me and I allow them to choose what they want. So, for example, uh, they can come and watch me coach. And then we'll follow that up with a conversation and they'll ask me why I did this, why I did that. So I literally had a Skype conversation earlier this week with one of my mentees who came down to watch me coach probably the last session we did before we were shut down, which was two weeks ago. Um, I'm happy to go and watch them coach, although we kind of put a caveat on that. But, um, you know, being watched by your mentor can be quite stressful and you can feel under pressure. So don't feel any compunction to do that. We can just meet on Skype and chat through things. They can send me session plans and I can comment on that. So it's it's having a broad menu of um, opportunities that as a mentor you can offer your mentee. Um, and I think that for me, the realization that it's building a relationship with them so they begin to trust and respect you, that's far more important than the, you know, the content or, um, you know, um, feeling that you have to deliver things to them. Yeah, I think that's huge. Um, so there's there's a few questions that have come in, um, mm -hmm. and one is holding the floor, but we'll make one wait <laughs> a little bit longer. Um, this is from Trent Frederick, all the way from Florida. Trent, I hope you're well. He says, what are your top three uh, book recommendations for coach development? Okay, top three. So I've just finished reading John O'Sullivan's book, Every Moment yeah. Matters, and I really like that. Um, yeah. It's a really, really well-written book. There's so many messages in there which I agree with. You know, what is your purpose as a coach? Why do you coach? Uh, you know, it's all about the relationships. You know, my I, I wouldn't say that I have a philosophy as a coach. I kind of think about it in terms of what's my what is my purpose and what is my approach. And, you know, I think my purpose is can I help the people that I'm coaching become better people? And yeah. I have a little saying that, you know, if you coach the person, the player looks after themselves. And I think that kind of resonates with John's book. Um, there's a couple of more academic books that have come out recently. So Brian Geraghty and Bettina Callery from the United States Center for Coaching, or I think it's kind of linked in with the United States Center for Coaching Excellence. They've just done a book on coach developer, coach developers. Um, and then 
and then you know I might go a bit left field so I've just read a book called uh, evidence informed learning design by Paul Kirshner and I think it's Margaret Nealon but it's all about evidence-based learning how do people learn and what evidence do we have rigorous scientific evidence to support various theories about learning uh, so they are very kind of like dismissive of learning styles growth mindset stuff like this and actually they're quite supportive of instruction not instruction in terms of lecturing people but just good quality teaching um, so it yeah it's it's just uh demystifying some of the myths i guess about how we go about designing learning and how we go about supporting learning yeah which I effectively that... is what we do as coach developers isn't it that, that's what yeah. we do we, we support learning absolutely I so think, is it dr dick bailey that talks about richard uh, bailey yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Bailey, right yeah. Yeah. learning yeah. styles stuff like yeah. that so uh, he doesn't like those <laughs> yes. yeah he, no yeah. yeah he presented at the open university a couple of years ago and he did his talk about um yeah uh, all the myths around learning and stuff like this he gets quite passionate about it mm. he does he does indeed and I, I, you know I, I love the fact that he's i think his uh, tagline was a uh, children are not many adults right that's right um, yeah, so, exactly. um yeah. so th this is a question from deborah that's come in um deborah is a retired PE teacher and her question is is now that we're going through a crisis around the world coronavirus mm. how can coaches and clubs and club directors continue providing resources to use at home and if you want to hit a few of these alex and you know we'd already spoke about yeah, this. Sure. it's about content isn't it what kind of content can you give your your players one thing i've done with my team at uh, portsmouth is um uh, use the website called tifo to have some quite nice short animations particularly the tactical ones and i've just kind of given them um through our sort of through their parents really through our um whatsapp group suggested little you know some of these little videos that they can watch um think about the game tactically um it, it is just so difficult isn't it what can they do at home and um i mean here in the uk all the schools finish tomorrow and no one really knows when they're going to go back so that you know, we could be looking down looking at say i don't know three months of not being able to yeah. do much or go out you know go too far um so how can you get them thinking about the game? Um, that would be one of the things that I might do. How can you do a little bit of home exercise? Our local, uh, our local sports centre where I'm a member, um, they emailed last night and they've arranged for all the members to have access to some virtual classes. So at half past seven this morning, I did a virtual sort of yoga class, <laughs> um, which was quite interesting. Um, it's quite good to be fair. Uh, I quite enjoyed it. So maybe things like that that people can do, and I think maybe more people are going to have to kind of do that to stay active and to um, you know, maintain uh, maintain their health, as it were. So yeah. I guess I guess we're all going to come up with ideas, aren't we? And, and, and in terms yeah. of where you are, a pay to play model, perhaps there's a little bit more uh, focus yeah. on it than what we have in this country, where yeah. grassroots soccer is, you know, volu voluntary and and um, you know, it's not such an expense for the parents in many ways. Yeah. So yeah, just to answer, uh, add on to that, you know, we've uh, there's little videos, there's little content that's going out from Rush National, from from local. There's videos. You know, the question to add on to that, Deborah, is, is what do children want in these times? Mm -hmm. Um, because the schools are asking them to do online stuff. The the parents are getting inundated with work stuff. And, you know, I think sometimes it's, uh, you know, some of the experts are saying, don't limit screen time, don't do this in these times. And for me, I think it's Christmas in March, basically. Um, yeah. Yeah. And just, yeah. you know, or it could be the summer holidays in March. Um, but just making sure children are getting the opportunity to, to do some stuff, but also there's some content, like Alex said, yeah. that is good um and you know there's a bunch of little videos and challenges and things yeah. like that and i suppose it's also thinking one of the things i struggled with going from um you know from chichester where i was at the university on campus more or less every day to effectively being a home worker is you need to get yourself into some kind of routine some kind of structure whatever that routine and structure looks like yeah uh, I, I think that's huge 
you know. But I also think it's important that children get a little bit of time to enjoy that time off too. Yep. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Because yeah. it's um, stress it's stressful for them, isn't it? You know, the kind oh. of worry and stuff like that. So Yeah, it's you know, they strange. they're not used to having mum and dad home. Right, mm. mum and dad worrying about where there's, where's the next mortgage check coming from. So yep. the stress yep. and the the, uh, the things we'll have to do for mental health and physical activity afterwards. But I think it's key what you said, Alex, the routine and the structure. But I think yep. um, exercise can is, is proven to help reduce um, or you know reduce the stress and mental health issues. So just getting the kids out there just to get their their uh, activity. Um, but of course, practice social distancing, not like the children yeah, in Florida yeah, and uh, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. So um, we've got a couple of things from one Gonzalez Mendia. And he says, um, what is your best coach developer questions? What are your best coach developer questions? Yeah, OK, my best coach developer questions, questions that I might ask the coaches that I'm working with. Um, yeah. So the first thing is, actually, you could you could say, well, why are you doing this? there's a problem when you kind of start a question with why because maybe the coach then gets on the defensive straight away as though you kind of like um you know they feel as though uh you're you're just um you know going to be probing them a little bit sort of critically so i i sometimes when i'm talking to a coach i'll say have you thought about doing this in this way or i was really interested in that just just tell me what you're thinking was behind that practice what 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 were your thoughts there what were you hoping to try and um try and achieve in that respect so i'm trying to draw out their thinking the reasons why they're doing what they're doing without being too direct and saying why did you do that you know so it comes across a little bit negatively so i think there's a real skill to asking questions and and what i like to try and do from a coach development point of view is tease out why they're doing what they're doing the what the why and the how um, mm -hmm. and once you've kind of got them opening up a little bit then i think you can get into that kind of conversation um i mean i think as coach developers there's you know there's a, a debate to be had about whether we provide coaches with feedback or whether in fact we engage in a constructive conversation with coaches I think I'm moving more, certainly moving more to the latter. It's about having a constructive conversation with a coach as opposed to giving them feedback on their session. So, yeah. Um, and, and, and watch and observe. Um, the other thing that I've learned is, you know, being a tutor, we often have a checklist of things that we're looking for. And when you have a checklist, your kind of observation is geared to what's on the checklist so you know what you, you're looking for what the checklist is telling you to look for sometimes now i just go and watch i don't have a checklist or anything like that i just go and watch and i find that i notice things that i might not notice otherwise and some of those things are quite interesting to pick up on and have a conversation about um can you give us a, an example of some of the stuff you're noticing alex yeah so if i don't have a if, when you have a checklist you're focusing on the coach aren't you because you'll try to see what they're doing. But when you don't have a checklist, I've now got into the habit of not watching the coach, but looking at what the players are doing. Because if you watch what the players are doing, that can tell you a lot about what the coach is like through just watching the coach. So are the players engaged? What's their behaviours like? Um, you know, when the coach tells them to go and do something, how do they go and do that? What, what does that tell you about the general kind of environment that the coach is creating? And, and, and I find watching and observing and noticing what the players are doing and how they're behaving can give you a really good idea about the environment because if you're watching the coach you probably know that the coach is putting on a performance for you but the players probably aren't to, to, to a lesser extent you know they're doing what they kind of normally would do so i think it gives you a slightly different insight into what happens when you might not be there um, you know how, how does the coach divide up the the group you know, who does he put with who is that a dynamic that's working or what have you who's getting the lion's share of the coach's attention why is that you know yeah. is that because that's a disruptive individual is that they're marginalizing the quieter shyer person who's kind of not getting the the time and the input from the coach that they might want or they're just kind of being left to their own devices yeah are, they, so, are the same players answering the questions 
Or exactly. Is it, yeah. 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 Who's, who's on the inside of the circle dominating things and who's on the outside kind of not contributing and not engaging. And yeah. so, you know, I must admit, I, I, particularly when I'm working with a new coach, I might spend quite a lot of time just watching the players and their behaviors and getting a feel for them. And what's that yeah. telling me about the environment that uh, the coach is creating? Yeah, I, uh, I did a school visit the other day and uh, I, I, I laid out. So basically what we what I started uh, about four years ago was 55 elementary schools in Virginia Beach, um, kindergarten through fifth grade. And I challenged, can you be ingrained in the community? So we we'd take over the PE class and we teach football. Um, mm -hmm teach football through the PE classes and we go through all the grades and we try and use positive positive discipline so we would praise the behaviors we wanted so I'd go in I'd use a little bit of Mark, Mark Bennett's work right what's acceptable what's unacceptable yep, and what's yep. exceptional yep. and then we'd do the outline I'd go along uh, you know Mark and Stuart have actually been guests on the webinar on, on our webinar too and um, mm -hmm. Anyway, so I, I go on and uh, I, I outline the things and we're just getting the kids movement right and uh, moving. And every child does not, followed my directions, but didn't comprehend everything. So the teacher was getting annoyed and I'm like, you know, Mr. Hill, you know, don't blame the kids. Listen, there's a hundred kids out here and every kid has done what I've asked them to do, for example. So therefore, it must have been my explanation. It mm -hmm. was not clear enough. He goes, well, I understood it. I said, yeah, but look, there's a hundred of them. You understood it, the staff understood it, but they didn't, so it's my explanation. And yeah. he's like, you know what? I, I never looked at things that way. So it's, uh, it's important, right? So just noticing and then uh, I think listening to some degree as well, right? Just listening yeah, 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 yeah. and yeah. Uh, it is huge. Um, yeah. So what one goes to add on, he says, um, you know what? how do you make people feel comfortable during these conversations? So when you're doing your coach developer stuff, yeah, you know, yeah. what are some of the things? And obviously okay. I think you answered that a little bit yeah. already, um, yeah. relationship, um, but yeah. then asking the question so they're not getting defensive yeah. um, and considering and, uh, the, yeah. Yeah, I think it comes down to how well you build the relationship and that's from right from the outset of the relationship. So what I do now is on the FA's mentoring program, when I have a, a new coach that uh, asks for, um, you know, to be part of the mentoring program, I'll, I'll deliberately, the first meeting that we have, meet away from the, where they're coaching. We might go to a, a local coffee shop or a local hotel, um, just sit down, we'll have a very general conversation about what the mentoring program involves, what's my role. Um, and then I try and kind of steer the conversation around to, you know, what do they do? What's their job? You know, why are they coaching? Invariably it might be because their son or daughter's involved in the team. Uh, and then I kind of try and find a point of connection. You know, that might be we support the same team or we know some of us, some of a person. So you're just trying to get to know them at a personal level. Uh, so before we do anything about, you know, developing their coaching, you're trying to establish uh, that connection straight away. Um, and then if they're comfortable with you, then I think you can get into these kinds of, of, of conversations. Um, the one thing which uh, we had a, a FA coach mentors conference, I think it was three years ago now, and I went to a one of the seminars which was delivered by two policemen, and they were from Manchester, and they worked in the crisis unit. So these are the, the policemen that will go out if someone's standing on top of a car park or whatever, and kind of threatening to throw themselves off of it. And what stuck with me was that you don't talk these people down you listen them down. So the idea is that rather than going up there and saying, look, you know, don't be silly, come on down. That's not gonna work. You've got to sort of listen, why are they there? You've got to begin to empathize with their situation and see it from their point of view. And then you'll build the trust and the rapport and then you can begin to have the influence which might make them step back from what it is they're gonna do. Uh, so it's, it's actually, 
called the, the uh, behavioral change stairway model and we put it in the course and it actually does come out from crisis negotiation uh, situations the way in which you try and negotiate with hostage takers or whatever it might be but it, for me I, I kind of really stuck with me really resonated me with a, a, a method by which you kind of work with coaches that you first of all you've got to listen to them understand them get to know them as people empathize with that their situation you know that remember they might be a novice coach they might just literally have done their level one and, whereas you're a highly experienced coach you've got to be aware of the power dynamic you know i'm there with an fa top with the three lions i mean that kind of immediately um, creates a dynamic in terms of their perception of what that badge means um, and if you can kind of build that rapport build that trust build that respect then I think you have the basis on which you can influence and change behavior and whatever you say to them whatever suggestions you make uh, they might be more receptive to it than if you just kind of barrel in there and say well look you know I don't think you could be doing that you've got the kids lined up see so for example quite often when I go and see a coach you know you do see children lined up in lines and it's like you want to you you want to go in and say don't do that yeah but you, it's, it's not the point it's not the time you know maybe once you build a relationship and you say like you know why do we ever think about doing this differently to having every child lined up behind each other why, why do we kind of like just do some 1v1 games here and you know maybe they've got to kind of like dribble through a gate before they can put the ball into the goal if you know if that's the kind of outcome that you want to focus on or whatever it might be but uh, I think, I think I mean Stuart features on the course and it's the, one of the things that he says in one of the little um, videos that he's done is about it's it's not it's knowing not to step in too soon and correct someone it's finding the right time the opportune moment where you've built that relationship to when they might say okay yeah I'll, you know I'll have a go at that so as a case I've been working with a coach this year we first met back in September so what's that that's the best part of eight months ago now uh, inexperienced coach well-meaning dad just done his level one his son plays on the team his son's probably the best player um, you know our kind of first meeting was in a, a local hotel on a Friday evening just got to know each other uh, he's come down to see me coach and watch me coach and we've kind of had a conversation about that and then I went to watch him coach on a Saturday morning and we had lots of kids with a ball uh, dribbling in and out of cones and then back in a line and that was that was October end of October time but it's only been January so the first part of this year where I've gone now Phil what about if we did this instead of this and he's gone okay yeah no happy to try that go on then off you go and he's kind of yeah that, that's really worked like you know everyone was engaged and focused and so you've got their buy-in but that's taken you know maybe took five months let's say to get to that point where you know you feel as though you could suggest something to him let him have a go of it explore it and then you know because you've built that relationship and it worked it it, it just kind of reinforced the point yeah and i think it's it's huge right i mean you you've mentioned relationships we've talked about um just getting to know people cultivating cultivating trust rapport you know uh, empathy right empathy it, it's it it is our core value this month actually empathy is a core value this month yeah yet. so uh, along with safety which is which is going on as well um right. but uh just really emphasizing those things and i you know the, the fact that johnny o'sullivan's book who's also been a guest on our webinar alex mm -hmm. and if you don't know john i'll introduce you to him as well okay um via email but just the fact you know better people and i just think that relationship and it can be so undervalued right and yeah. especially yeah. now in these times we're gonna have to work really hard to cultivate and redevelop those relationships as we know them um yeah. one one makes a statement here he says no one wakes up in the morning and goes oh i can't i can't wait to queue up for my turn today um <laughs> but uh I, you know just think of that in real life now people queuing in grocery stores and all that kind of stuff yeah. 
Nobody's like, oh, great, I can't wait to queue. So coaches, listen, listen to that. Um, mm. this, is, um, this is a question from Liam Lacey um, from Scotland all the way in Chicago. He says, one of the videos within the course references just-in-time learning. From a teaching background, okay. how would you apply this concept practically to coaching? Oh. So, um, yeah, so we use that in, um, I think it was session eight or maybe it was one of the other sessions on teaching, just in time learning. So what do people need to learn now? You know, so rather than, rather than having a curriculum, what is it that people um, need to focus on at this moment in time? Um, so, I mean, I think there's lots of arguments this, or, or lots of debate to be had about whether you should have quite a structured linear curriculum or maybe have some kind of approach to how you organize and structure um, your learning and development. Um, so this is probably a, not a great answer to the question, but it's thinking about, um, yeah, what, what does this coach need at this point in time? What would give you the best return or the best return for the coach in terms of their learning, rather than having kind of like a preset curriculum that you're gonna work through? Um, and that that's something which I'm quite um, quite passionate about in a way. Uh, I wrote a paper with a colleague of mine which got published in UK Coaching's Applied Research Journal just before Christmas. And, and we were trying to argue that coach or governing bodies, let's say, or you know, sports organisations should move away from a traditional approach to coach education that like you go on a course of five days and there's a curriculum there um, and with the kind of technology that we have now could we move to a situation where a coach kind of like curates their own learning based on the context in which they're working so there might be for example a core or a couple of core workshops that coaches need to do, which would be the mandatory part of their learning and development. But they could then go away and you know, do other seminars, other workshops, webinars. Um, they could kind of benefit from the learning of their, of their peers and their colleagues locally. And they build, they build their own curriculum. They build their own learning program. And at some point when they feel comfortable, they might be assessed. So assessment is detached from any kind of formal uh, curriculum. So if you imagine if you maybe studying for, you know, you, you, um, you know, B license or an A license, it's probably being organized on a fairly traditional formal course like basis where the assessment is integrated into it. So what we said is, well, first of all, separate the assessment from the course. And maybe think about actually how do people learn and the different kinds of opportunities and experiences that people learn from and so coming back to the question that's a bit like the just-in-time learning you know what do i need to know now in order to be able to achieve this youtube's a good example of that isn't it isn't it because um yeah and this is a point that paul kirshner makes regularly you know, Google is great for some things, but it's not good for other things. Like if you want to learn how to wire a plug, you can go and find probably a thousand videos on YouTube that will tell you how to wire a plug. If you want to solve a problem, Google's not going to help you solve a complex problem. Um, so some things are good for some types of learning and other things are good for you know, different types of learning. And so it's what do I, you know, if, if I need to learn how to wire a plug at this moment, then probably Google is where I'll get it from. If I need to work out how I deal with this difficult player because they have kind of some behavioral issues, Google's probably not going to help me with that, but I may need to go to somewhere else for that. So, yeah, so um, I, I just think we need to think now about how we organize coach learning and development and do it in a different way. And there are some governing bodies in England like hockey and badminton that are taking that approach. So hockey have their kind of menu approach now, where as a coach, you can choose from a menu of different activities. And like I say, piece together your own meal, uh, which is the same as curating your own learning program. Yeah. And uh, Liam says he appreciates your answers and he loves that. Um, I hope, hope that's helped, Liam. No, he said he, he did. And he says maybe that could be your next project, Alex. Yeah, you know, I think 
I'd love to be involved in a, what I really enjoy doing is designing learning. I've kind of realized now, particularly over the last sort of four or five years, that that's, that's what I really enjoy doing, you know, designing learning, designing programs and thinking about the connections. So um, if, if I was in charge of coach education, if of some organization, I'd probably maybe do things quite differently to the way that they've traditionally been done. Uh, so I know I've, us, well, no, I've had some, what, so what uh, things would you do differently? Oh. So, so um, I've had some conversations with colleagues at the FA and I've said, look, rather than running the level one as this kind of four day course or the you know, level two as a four day course, why do we just have, let's say at level one, why don't we just have a one day course, which focuses on how we play. So that's the principles of the game. Don't worry about how you're going to deliver it. Don't worry about the pedagogical aspects. Let's just have a day where we really help the coaches focus on this is a game of football. What what does a game of football look like? What are the two teams trying to do? And what are some of the principles in terms of the decisions and what have you that players need to make in the game of football? So that might be a one day workshop. It's and that's a compulsory part of your learning. There's another one day workshop which links to the England DNA, which is about how we coach. Right. Let's not talk about technical tactical. Let's just talk about different approaches to session practice design, session design. So this is about the pedagogical aspects of your coaching. How are you going to deliver it? How are you going to deliver the information, the knowledge that you have about the game? So this is where we would go into looking at different types of practice design, constraints based learning and so forth, teaching games for understanding. Right. So there's your other kind of core module, core workshop. The challenge for the coaches then is, so we've given you some knowledge about the game, how we play. We've given you some knowledge about how you can deliver the, the knowledge that you have, the professional knowledge that you have and so forth. You're now responsible for going away, putting some of that into action, learning from experience, talk to other coaches, listen to some podcasts, go on some seminars, go on some webinars, you know, think about what kind of support do you need for the, for the context in which you're coaching. That might be five to eight year olds. It might be teenagers. It could be semi-pro footballers. It could be uh, mixed football. It could be disability football. And, and what a governing body can do is that they can start to put on specialist workshops for these different contexts. And, you know, over a period of six months, you might build a learning program which helps you to support uh, the players that you're working with. And then you reach a point and you say, I think I'm now ready to be assessed to get my, I wouldn't necessarily call it level one. I'd move away from numbers and I would just maybe kind of like use, you know, introduction to coaching qualification or something like that, or introduction to coaching football or introductory coaching award. Um, and great done that right now move on to the kind of next the next, next level step. as it were yeah. next step so you would then do a two-day workshop on how we play and a two-day workshop on how we coach and those are your golden threads through your structure so by the time you get to the a license you might end up doing a four-day course on how we play which is really getting involved in the technical and tactical detail of of, of the game and you might equally do a four-day workshop on you know, how we coach, which is really getting into the, the nitty gritty of building relationships with your players and different co approaches to coaching and different types of sessions. And so you've got a golden thread all the way through from the bottom to the top. Brilliant. Brilliant. Which I think is so often missing. Right. Um, and I know, like you said, England hockey uh, have got their golden thread and yep. they're working yep. towards that um, right. here, you know, you know, I don't know whether you know how much you know about Rush, Alex, but we're in 33 states with 40 clubs mm -hmm. and uh, we're in 30 countries as well. And we have a Rush way to play. But, you know, what's really missing is I won't call it the golden thread. I'll call it the blue thread, right? The blue mm -hmm. thread of what unites us all the way through, which is, you know, quite a big task. When you think about clubs, playing styles, identities, um, you know, teams within the same club, in a local town play differently um, yeah. so just yeah. thinking of the magnitude of that so um this is a this will we'll take a couple more questions but this is from okay. julian Coropolese. uh julian sorry if i butchered your name it says what inspires you from coaching alex what inspires, from, yeah, yeah. Coach, 
from coach coaching. developing or yeah, yeah, yeah. coaching in general? Uh, so from a coaching point of view, what really inspires me is, um, I think it's the intellectual challenge, if I can put it that way. I, I spent hours thinking about how I can help my players become, you know, not just better players, but better people. You know, how can I really design sessions which help them and, and uh, meets their kind of objectives, um, both at a team level and an individual level. Um, so, you know, I find coaching intellectually stimulating and that kind of fires my passion and fires my interest because we're never, I, I, I read something about Bielsa and that he kind of, he's a perfectionist. He always wants to pe play the perfect game, but he knows you'll never play the perfect game and he tortures himself because he knows he can never reach a point of perfection. And I kind of really, uh, that really resonated with me because I want my team to play a perfect game of football, but I know they'll never achieve that perfect state. And that kind of tortures me and frustrates me in a way. Um, so definitely from the coaching point of view, it's about helping the players that I coach become you know, better players, but nicer people as well. People that I can be proud of and want to be associated with. And I've been really fortunate that over the years, you know, I've worked with some really good people that I'm still in touch with. And if I ever bump into them, you know, we will still have a really good like conversation. From a coach development point of view, it, it's similar. It, it's helping someone become a better coach so that they can coach the players that they're coaching better. So yeah, it's, you know, if I can be helpful, if I can help someone become you know, a better coach and perhaps a better person as, as a consequence of that. If I can help them see things differently and raise their level of awareness about what they're doing, then I feel that's a job well done. Yeah, I agree. And I think, uh, you know, you've said it quite a few times this webinar, you know, better people, better people, better people. Mm -hmm. And I think it was James Kerr's book, uh, Legacy, that says uh, better people make better all blacks. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah that's right. This is this is a question from Evan Pashunko, and he says, "Do you find your job stressful?" Um, no. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, the, the time when I have found coaching stressful is when I was managing a, a, a managing this semi pro team, and that was more about the kind of politics of the club and dealing with things which weren't necessarily associated with what was happening on the pitch. And, and yeah, that, that kind of stuff was, was stressful, but uh, the actual sort of working with the players, designing sessions, helping people, that's, I mean, I just look forward to that. I look forward to training, you know, I don't yeah. find it stressful. Uh, yeah. Even do if you, things do, uh, Yeah, I was going to say, if, what if, what if you plan and develop this session and you've thought about the needs of the individual and the team yep. but it's just not coming out it's just not coming out what's uh yeah. so i've learned to just accept that that happens sometimes and you've got to go with it and then reflect on it in fact that happened to me about three weeks ago four weeks ago did a session and it didn't really go the way that i wanted but you know i've kind of had enough experience that okay let's just kind of um, move this on let's go into a game or something else and, and i think why didn't that kind of like working the way that I wanted it to work. Yeah. Uh, then when you do something and you sit down, I, I'm, I, I still draw out my sessions on with pen and paper. I just like doodling and draw it out. So when you come up with something and it really works and you can see it's achieving what it is, you want it to achieve. I just get a real buzz from that. And I think we all do probably, don't we? Absolutely, yeah, the adrenaline kicks in, and um, yeah, Eureka moments, right? Yeah, Eureka exactly. Moments, as it were. Really so, this is a question from Trent, and he said, "What is the best advice you can give to mentors going into a new mentee relationship?" So, the best advice I can give to a mentor: take time to get to know that your mentee, the person you're working with. Don't be too eager to step in and give advice and tell them what to do. Um, be very open and offer uh, offer them 
the range of things that you can do. So don't say, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, but you know, what, what help do they want from you? You know, it, it's, it's for their benefit. So what can you do to help them? Yeah. And, and that would be my starting point. Just meet somewhere quiet, have a coffee, sit down, get to know them, find out a little bit about them and then, you know, ask them, you know, how can I help you become a better coach? Is that yeah. what you want? And once you've Brilliant. got an idea as to what they want, then you can start to build out your program and come up with a bit of strategy in terms of how you're going to do that. Yeah, I think that's super good advice. And then we'll take this as the final question. And this is from Neil McNabb um, from Georgia. So Neil, thanks for joining us. He says, who do you look up to, Alex? Who is your mentor? Or so, give us a couple yeah, along the yeah, way. Good question. Right. A couple of the, OK, so people that I look back now. Um, that I've you know, looked upon as as mentors was, to be fair, um, you know, when I was out in the States back in the late 80s, early 90s, I thought Gary was a you know, real mentor just in terms of his approach. Um, he's a real educationalist um, and takes a very kind of considered, deeply thinking approach to coaching and player development. Um, then I worked with a guy called Jim Kelman and Jim's enthusiasm, his passion, and the way that he used to come up with practices, which you think, oh, I just absolutely love playing in that practice. Um, so he was a, a, another mentor. Um, and then I, I suppose, yeah, so those two people definitely had an impact. Um, would you say that, uh, would you say that Alf? But indirectly, yeah, indirectly, you know, someone was definitely Alf was definitely someone who who I kind of um, you know respected and thought a lot about. Uh, I'd say at the moment, like Sean is is a bit of a mentor in a way. I certainly respect him, and you know, really appreciate kind of the way he looks at the game and looks at it in you know in a different way. Um, so I really enjoy that. Uh, I think that's been really beneficial. I mean, I think for me, for a long time, having that group of friends around me in Chichester, we almost co-mentored each other. You know, it's almost like a co-creation of, of knowledge and understanding. Uh, we were sort of mentoring and mentored by each other, as it were. I mean, that was a stage that it kind of got to. Um, and then I suppose in terms of, you know, uh, football wise, I don't know these people, but you know, fascinated by like Bielsa and his approach to the game. You know, he seems to have had an influence over a lot of coaches. Um, it, I was up actually in Bishop Auckland a few weeks ago, uh, so not too far away from Middlesbrough, and Leeds were actually playing Middlesbrough at Middlesbrough that night, and I was like, oh, I wonder if I can get from Bishop Auckland to Middlesbrough to go and see the game. Um, but you couldn't get tickets. <laughs> You couldn't just sort of turn up on the night and get tickets, so I had to shelf that idea. Um, yeah, so I think there you are know, definitely people that I've looked up to and respected and value their time and their insight and, you know, how they've shaped my learning and my development. So it's not, uh, not Mourinho after you analyse the games at Spurs? I, I, do you know what? I think... Um, it's been brilliant watching Spurs for the last three years, you know, culminated in getting through to the Champions League final and seeing that team and, 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 and the way they play. And there was a stage actually, um, probably, you know, this time last year when I went to a few of the games um, and even at that point, they weren't playing particularly well, um, certainly in the Premier League and you felt things were changing a little bit. I think the next couple of years are going to be really fascinating at Spurs to see which way Mourinho takes them. I think it's probably his biggest managerial challenge because he's not going to get a lot of money. Um, you know, he's going to be constrained in that way. Um, and I think the game is changing. And is he going to change in terms of his own tactical approach, the way he works well, with the players? People management, right? People, people management, management, exactly. Yeah. So I'm, you know, OK, we might not get to the same level of success as we've had in the past, but I think watching Spurs for me is now entering a different phase, which from a coaching point of view is equally going to be as fascinating to see what he does and how he does it. Yeah. 
and, and how he builds that team and you know the management around it I mean you'll never get the full story because you're not there you're not at the club uh, you only kind of get the mediated view of it don't you but um, yeah. I yeah. think there's only a couple of things being it's worse than being a Spurs fan at the at current I think that's been a Villa fan um, oh, I'm a Villa fan. <laughs> Born and raised. So yeah. this, this is uh, we'll take this as the final question, Alex, and then we'll wrap up because I want to be sensitive to your time, and maybe we'll just come back on and do a part two. But uh, this question is from Jim Leon, and he says, "Do you provide your mentees a personal development plan form, and if so, what do you include?" Okay, so I don't, I don't, and the reason for that is that I want to try and might make my uh relationship with my mentees as informal and organic as possible and i think when we get into the idea of development plans it all becomes a little bit too formalized and structured also the mentees that i'm working with they're volunteers you know they're volunteer parents you know then it's not a profession it's not their job um so i'm kind of like quite sensitive to not making this a you know a structured formal relationship i want it to be quite organic and informal i want our conversations to be like the kind of conversation we're having at the moment you know i don't want to be having a conversation which is structured by an objective and a time frame and how we're going to evaluate that are we going to go green amber red and stuff like this so um you know the fa do provide us with some examples of action plans and things like that but i've kind of moved away from that and it's just a very free flowing organic informal kind of approach um and, and i my sense is that the mentees prefer that particularly given their background and and what have you i think for some of them they probably get enough performance appraisals and formalized learning plans and stuff like that in their jobs so probably the last thing they want is for me to come along and say right here's a Here's our learning plan, and this is how we're going to measure it. And in three months' time, we're going to assess how much progress you've made. Yeah. Uh, if, if that was done to me, it, it would be a turn off. And I actually think that um, that's one of the issues about having formal mentoring programs. Is it really mentoring? You know, mentoring for me is quite an informal process. You know, if you ask me, like the question you asked me a few minutes ago, who are my mentors? That was all like only in an informal space. So I think if we want to do something which is quite formalised, where we're trying to measure learning and plans, I don't think necessarily the word mentor is the right word to use in that respect. It's more like a coach educator. Yeah. Coach yeah, I, think I think that's very fair. So Alex, listen, we want to be sensitive of your time. We've been mm -hmm. going on for over an hour, but, uh, you know, thank you for joining that's us. I think there's Any another pleasure? question that's come in. It may be... Uh, it was a statement, uh, Mr. Leon says, thank you for asking the question and thank you for the feedback, um, you know. But, you know, where can, how can people get a hold of you? How can people follow you on Twitter? Before you answer that, just to, I'll let people know if you email me directly, I put it in the chat, I will send you the link to the course that Alex was involved heavily in developing. Um, but Alex, you know, how can people get a hold of you? How can, how can... Uh, so you can contact me at the OU, which is alex.twitchin at open.ac.uk. Um, I mean, I do have a Twitter account, which is mostly sort of retweets in a sense, but people can reach me. Um, I'm at e intelligent coach. So for yeah. that, yeah. We, we've got one last comment, and this guy he says, "Thanks, guys. Really enjoyed the organic discussion. Play up, Pompey. Play up, Pompey." <laughs> and that's yeah. from Neil. Neil, right. who's a uh, he played for City as a boy, and his dad played for City as well. Um, right. But anyway, Alex, thanks a lot. I think if you if you're agreeable, we'd love to get you on uh, for a second one. Maybe mm -hmm. we can uh, we'll get the course out, and maybe then we can uh, do it around the course where people can yeah, give yeah. feedback on their experiences yeah. of no, the course really and yeah. stuff like that. So, yeah, but. Alex, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for being part of my journey. Um, everybody, thanks for joining us as well. April 2nd is our next webinar with Orb Watts, where we're looking at internal and external cues. Um, and then, you know, we'll probably get Alex back on again to discuss the course. And, and uh, everybody stay safe in these uncertain times. Be well and uh, develop those relationships online, offline, 
um, any way you can and, and keep going. So, Alex, any final Thanks, words? No, just, uh, you know, like you say, stay safe and, um, you know, keep well. Brilliant. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, See Chris. you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining us.